Hello lovelies, in this video the brilliant Dr Edwards is going to be going over neuromuscular functions for your A level bargy. Now in this video we're going to be looking at the structure and how this plays a really really key role in connecting different bits together. So it was a really important one to focus on. If you want to make sure that you know everything, if you want to make sure you can answer questions on this in the exam, then to help you there are loads of questions over my website. Okay, so we're going to look at the neuromuscular junction, which is basically the synapse between a motor neuron and a muscle fibre. So we're going to look at how we get that action potential coming from the motor neuron, how it crosses that junction, the gap between the neuron and the muscle fibre, and then how that starts to lead to a contraction. So the synapse is actually between the end of a neuron, so the synaptic um, end and the sarcolemma of the muscle fibre. So that is here. And you can see I've got sort of multiple axon branches coming out and sort of terminating and having that neuromuscular junction with one muscle fibre. And you can kind of see all of the structures we looked at in the last video. So we've got the sarcolemma around the outside. We've got the sarcophasic reticulum in, in sort of blue-green covering around the outside of the myofibrils. And then we have those T-tubules that we spoke about, which is the infolding of this sarcolemma membrane to make these tubes that go all the way down and around the myofibril. So this time, instead of initiating another action potential, as if it would if it was a synapse with another neuron, what actually happens is the signal passes across the synapse and it causes the muscle fibre to contract. So that's the aim here. We're not aiming to cause another action potential, we're aiming to cause a contraction. So some motor neurons, like this one, stimulate a single muscle fibre. So one motor neuron, and although there's sort of multiple axon terminals here, they are junction onto one muscle fibre. But what other motor neurons can do is they can divide and split. So these kind of multiple axon branches and axon terminals can actually then join up to many muscle fibres all at once, which can then be stimulated to contract all at the same time. And this is what we would call a motor unit, motor unit and it provides a stronger contraction. Okay, so we've got kind of a closer up picture of an axon terminal, kind of the actual neuromuscular junction now, which looks sort of similar to what we would seen when we looked at the synapse diagram previously. And we're kind of comparing this to a cholinogenic synapse. Remember, that's one that uses acetylcholine. And initially, the kind of first stages are exactly the same. So an action potential arrives at the part of the axon just above the synapse in the presynaptic neuron, and it causes the change in membrane potential, and that causes the influx of the calcium ions to come into the presynaptic neuron, which causes the release of the acetylcholine that's in those vesicles. And they fuse with the edge of the membrane of the presynaptic neuron and release their contents by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft. So all of that is exactly the same as how we described an action potential arriving at cholinogenic synapse. It's just what happens afterwards. So we're just mostly looking at the differences in the postsynaptic membrane and what happens there, because we've not just got another neuron and it's a little bit more complicated. So in the same way as before, the acetylcholine is going to diffuse across the synaptic cleft and it's going to bind to receptors. But this time you'll notice there are folds in the sarcolemma. So it's not just like a smooth, straight surface. There's lots of folds. And all of the receptors are within kind of the membrane on those folds. This opens sodium channel, sodium ion channels in the sarcolemma. So that part is also the same, except obviously those sodium ion channels are in the sarcolemma this time, not in the membrane. And then the sodium ions enter the sarcolemma and depolarize it. So it does depolarize the membrane in the same way, but instead of sort of moving through and down kind of a narrow axon, what actually happens is the wave of depolarization spreads along the sarcolemma. So it goes along the sarcolemma and then it goes down the T-tubules to get to sort of the outside of that muscle fiber. And you can see that the T-tubules then come into contact with the sarcoplasmic reticulum and you can see the calcium ions there. So that is where we're trying to take that change in membrane potential and that depolarization of the sarcoplasm then around the muscle fiber and around the 
sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to trigger the release of those calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which are going to move down into the myofibril, and that is what will trigger the muscle contraction. And we'll look at that in more detail when we look at how the muscle actually contracts and shortens, but we need to know how those calcium ions are released by that depolarization. So mostly it's the same as what we've looked at before with the synapse, but we have to think about what words we're using the language. So we're talking about the sarcolemma instead of talking about the postsynaptic membrane. And we're talking about the wave of depolarization spreading along the sarcolemma and then down the T-tubules into the muscle fiber and then triggering the release of calcium ions from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All of that is new and different from when we looked at just the normal, regular synapse. Okay, so if we have a look at directly comparing the two examples that we've learned. So we're comparing the cholinogenic synapse and the neuromuscular junction because they both use acetylcholine. Obviously, there are other synapses that use other neurotransmitters, such as dopamine or noradrenaline. So we have to think about this is just comparing one to another synapse that uses acetylcholine. So the sort of synapse we looked at would be between neurons and other neurons. So sensory neuron and relay neuron, for example, or neurons and glands. Whereas when we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, we're just looking at motor neurons and muscles only. That's the only thing, that's what the gap is between. The synapse that is um, a cholinergic synapse can be excitatory or inhibitory. And remember, we said that depends on the location of the synapse. So in some places, cholinergic synapses or synapses that use acetylcholine are going to be excitatory. But we did give that example that in the heart, occasionally the synapses that use acetylcholine can be inhibitory as well. In the neuromuscular junction, these sort of the gaps, the synapses and the nerves that are joined to them are always going to be excitatory. Pretty much every time an action potential arrives at one of those motor neurons, it always causes a contraction. And that's because, you know, if the signal is happening there, then that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to cause a contraction. The action potential is then triggered in a postsynaptic neuron if we are talking about a cholinogenic synapse. So it's going from one neuron to the another neuron and it's the postsynaptic neuron. We're triggering an action potential there to pass along that signal. In the neuromuscular junction, the action potential is triggered in the sarcolemma and it travels down the T-tubules or the wave of depolarization is triggered in the sarcolemma and it travels down the T-tubules. And really, we're not trying to trigger an action potential. We're trying to ultimately trigger a contraction. We're not passing on the signal, we're just causing it to lead to contraction of the muscle. In the cholinogenic synapse, the acetylcholine binds to receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. Remember, our language is slightly different for the neuromuscular junction, and there's some other differences as well. So the neuromuscular junction has more acetylcholine receptors than a normal synapse, and they are in folds in the sarcolemma, where there are no folds in a normal synaptic crossing. And there's a lot more acetylcholine esterase in the folds in order to stop constant contraction from happening. So again, there is acetylcholine esterase in the normal cholinogenic synapse, but there's these kind of folds that specifically help to keep a lot of that enzyme in the folds, as well as the sodium ion receptors in the sarcolemma folds in the neuromuscular junction. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at, and I've sort of left it till this point to talk about these rather than talk about them when we did the first synapse, because a lot of these, the impact of things like drugs are to do with kind of paralysis or pain and things like that. So a lot of them act in the same way in both the synapse and the neuromuscular junction. So there are many medicinal drugs, illegal drugs, and also bioweapons that have been used in various wars or terrorist attacks that can alter the synaptic transmission, but in different ways. So we need to know these because they will be used as examples in questions. So you won't have to know exactly the drug or the poison or whatever it is and the name of it or learn any of that. But you need to be aware that they exist and think about kind of the knock on effects of what will happen if they block part of the synapses or neuromuscular junctions, because we have to think about being able to suggest or predict or analyze why a drug might have a certain effect based on the information it gives us about what part of the synapse or the neuromuscular junction is affected. So for example, some of the drugs can prevent the neurotransmitter from being released. So opioid painkillers, including things like morphine and codeine, they block the calcium ion channels 
in the presynaptic neuron. And so that prevents the exocytosis of the neurotransmitter into the cleft. And if you think ahead, if that doesn't happen, if no neurotransmitter gets released into the synaptic cleft, it won't bind to the receptors, which means it won't trigger an action potential in the next neuron, which means it stops the signal. Which, if you were taking these painkillers, you would want a pain signal to be prevented. So that that's an example of how these work. And you would have to, in your explanation, follow along to the logical conclusion. So you would, if it gave you this much information, you would then have to explain how that stops pain or how that prevents the signal from being transmitted. Another example is instead of preventing or blocking a signal, the drugs could mimic a neurotransmitter. So this is one that they like to use because it's one of those examples of shapes fitting together. So nicotine is a similar shape to acetylcholine. So it will be able to bind to the cholinogenic receptors. And so more receptors are activated if you have nicotine in your system than if you were just relying on the acetylcholine that was being released alone. And so that's going to act as a stimulant because if you bind to more of those sodium ion receptors, then you are going to release more sodium ions into the following neuron, which means you're kind of more guaranteed to generate an action potential and pass on the signal. So that's going to sort of act as a stimulant, speed up or increase the reactions to things. They can also, instead of binding to the receptor channels to trigger them, they can also block those receptors. So instead of blocking the calcium ion channel, in the presynaptic neuron, we're now talking about blocking the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. In this case, curare, which is a compound that's extracted from plants, and it's been used for many hundreds, if not thousands of years, to create poison-tipped arrows for hunting, especially in indigenous populations in the Amazon rainforest, for example. They um, extract compound from this plant, which is this chemical compound that acts as a paralytic agent. So it causes paralysis. They would put that on the tip of an arrow so that when a, a hunter shoots a bow and arrow or a blow dart, for example, and it pierces through and gets into the bloodstream of the animal, the poison acts to paralyze the animal so that they can, obviously it wouldn't get up and run away. It sort of makes the hunting more effective and then you can take your captured prey back with you quite easily or catch it enough to make sure it is dead before you can kind of take it home. So what these do is they just block those receptors at the neuromuscular junctions. So it stops the number of, or reduces the number of receptors that can be triggered, which means we're not going to be able to depolarize that sarcolemma, which means we won't have enough depolarization going down the T-tubules to trigger those calcium ions from being released, which means we don't get muscle contraction. And so therefore we cause paralysis because no signal is getting through to the muscles. So they will not be triggered to contract. So they will stay relaxed. Another example is the drugs could act to stimulate the release of more neurotransmitter. So amphetamines, another group of stimulant drugs, they block the transporter proteins that allow the reabsorption of dopamine into the presynaptic neuron. Here, we're talking about dopamine as an example of another neurotransmitter. So normally, after a release of the neurotransmitter and they've bound and it's passed on the action potential, any spare um, neurotransmitter would normally be broken down by enzymes, or in this case, sometimes it can be actively transported back into the presynaptic neuron. And obviously it needs special channel proteins to do that. And amphetamines will block them. So if it blocks them, that means the dopamine is going to stay in the synaptic cleft for longer and potentially build up. So more receptors get stimulated than normal. And again, obviously this then acts as a stimulant. So more likely to trigger action potentials, therefore more likely for signals to be passed on every single time. And then lastly, as we were just saying, instead of being actively transported back, we know we often have a neurotransmitter breakdown enzyme. The example we've learned about is acetylcholinesterase. So there are some nerve agents. They could be gases or they could be toxins. So sarin is an example and Novichok is an example, which was used very recently in some Russian interference into the UK in terms of being used to poison two people from Salisbury. And what that does is it inhibits the acetylcholinesterase enzyme. So it is an enzyme inhibitor. It could be used in a question then, for example, as an enzyme inhibitor question, or it could be used in a question about 
synapses. You could get both or you could get both parts of a question in one and you need to be able to explain both. The main thing here is that if you block acetylcholine esterase, then you are not going to be able to break down the acetylcholine that's in the synaptic cleft. So we're going to have the same issue where you're going to have overstimulation or constant stimulation because the acetylcholine isn't being removed from those receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. And so they're going to be continuously stimulated and it leads to loss of muscle control. It could be kind of jerky movements. It could be paralysis because there is no kind of way of controlling the signal that's going from the neuron to, in this case, the muscle fibers. So they just get constantly stimulated. OK, so these are five different ways that drugs can work. And mostly it's about thinking about, OK, well, if we block the calcium ion receptors on the presynaptic neuron, what will happen if we block the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron, what will happen? If we block acetylcholinesterase, what will happen? And being able to logically think through those steps and explain what knock-on effects these drugs can have, and then being able to explain why that either causes muscle paralysis or why that causes increased stimulation and things like that. It's one of those ones where these application questions can be quite tricky, but really they're just asking if you understand the process of how the synapse works and then being able to interpret what happens if part of that functioning is taken away. OK, so that's the neuromuscular junction. It's quite short, mostly looking at being able to compare it to a, a normal synapse, knowing the differences, getting that language right with the sarcolemma and the T-tubules and the wave of depolarization moving down it is going to be really important. And then being able to apply your knowledge of synapses and the neuromuscular junction to new scenarios with some of these drugs and things that can be used to interrupt how they work on a normal basis. The last thing we have to do for muscles then and the whole kind of nerves and coordination is to look at how muscles contract, which is going to be in the next video. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.